Okay. Um, many body Anderson localization, which is often mentioned without mentioning Anderson, <laughs> but it's a, it's a version of Anderson localization and it is in Anderson's original paper. So I like to put the name there in my title, but then drop it after that. So it's usually abbreviated MBL, many body localization. Um, and then the opposite of it is thermalization. And so I'll talk about both. And, and also one of the big things of interest is the phase transition between the two. Um, so these are not thermodynamic phases, but phases of the dynamics. Um, and and I'll, I'll get into that. OK, so it's really very general many body quantum dynamics. So we have a system containing many spins or many atoms. You know, experimentally, this is often ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices or something, um, or, or people who make qubits. For people building qubits to try to build a quantum computer, they can make them interact and do physics with them. I'm always trying to convince them, don't build a quantum computer, just do some physics. <laughs> and, and that message is, I think they, they kind of like that idea, because doing physics is easier than building a quantum computer. <laughs> it's sort of, you can view it as an intermediate step in the process. Um, so anyways, we have this many body quantum system. The box I put is just to say it's isolated. So it's many degrees are interacting with each other. Um, it's unitary local, right? isolated, meaning it's in a closed system. It's not coupled to other degrees of freedom outside. No phonons. Uh... Yeah, no phonons. We're ignoring, well, any degree of freedom which is involved is explicitly in the state. And then, yeah, it's not coupled to the rest of the universe, um, except there is a special case we often consider. So you notice here, I didn't write a Hamiltonian evolution. I wrote a discrete time evolution with a unitary. And so that's a special case which is of interest, um, or maybe it's a general case, the special case of which is time evolution with a unitary. But we could have discrete time, and so so this is, if, if, if this is not given by a time-independent Hamiltonian, but is given by a time-independent unitary, which repeats with a discrete time, this is what we call a Floquet system. Um, and it, you know, so we look at both types, you know, ones which come from a Hamiltonian, time-independent Hamiltonian, and ones which just come from a unitary. But they should be the same, right? Well, They're for example, yeah. One, of, one of the nice things about the unitary is you could have it have no conservation loss. Right? If you have a Hamiltonian, you have a conserved energy, you have the slow modes uh, so associated with the conserved energy. <laughs> Whereas if you drop that and consider it more generally, you can have something which has no hydrodynamics. There's no conserved quantities at all, but there's still unitarity, locality, interactions, entanglement, all that kind of stuff independent of transport, right? Nothing to transport other than quantum information or quantum coherence or quantum entanglement, that kind of stuff, right? So, so but I'll mostly today just talk about Hamiltonians because it's much more familiar and, the, and the, the, the reasons for getting away from the Hamiltonians and going to the more general unitaries are, they're not essential to the problem, although it's just something that's uh, there in a lot of the literature now, okay? So isolated. Excited, meaning we're talking about a system, if there is a Hamiltonian and there's a ground state, we're talking about states whose energy density is higher than the ground state. So if they do go to thermal equilibrium, they correspond to a non-zero temperature and they will have a non-zero entropy density, right? So, so, so by excited, I mean highly excited with extensive excitation energy, okay? Yeah. So the system has a state. It's undergoing unitary time evolution. We could think of a mixed state more generally, like I've written here, or we could go to a pure state. That's not so important for most of what I'm going to say. OK, and I was writing down some specific examples, which have been looked at a lot. So one of them is this one. Um, 
sigma n. So this is a Heisenberg spin chain with a random field, or actually with fields along the, uh, oriented to, to the, and there's two cases here. One is hn random, you know, iid, say drawn from a uniform distribution centered on 0. Um, and then another one is the quasi-periodic case, hn equals h cosine n times uh, you know, some number that's irrationally related to 2 pi <laughs> so that we make, so this is quasi-periodic. So it's not random, but the potential is quasi-periodic, and that system, uh, at least for single particle hopping, not spins, but for single particle hopping, that one has localization or not. You can have localization or not. This is uh, our Briandre model. Okay, so we're interested in both random and quasi-periodic, and I'll talk about the distinctions. We're starting to actually see some real distinctions between these two, and I think that's a very interesting thing. And let me just show another model, um, which I mentioned because that's what Embry looked at, which would be uh, sum on n, uh, so let me write it this way, j n sigma z. So just an Ising coupling instead of a Heisenberg coupling. Um, and then an Hn, sigma Zn, random fields. Couplings could be random, not important. If, if you, you know, if one of these is random and not the other, it's, but yeah, we have random fields. And then he put a transverse field, sigma Xn. So this is, this is the specific model which Embry actually uh, proves some things about. Okay. And this, this model is the one where there's more numerics than any other model. Right? A lot of this field is, is uh, right. There's very little controlled systematic calculations that can be done on these problems. Um, so a lot of what we do is come up with ideas which aren't under that much control and then just compare them as best as we can to numerics, which often means just take a Hamiltonian, take a realization of it, diagonalize it, and look at the exact spectrum, exact eigenstates, and calculate various lots of different things. Okay. So exact diagonalization is, is, is the main tool for yeah. numerics? You yeah, can't yeah. look at a time evolution, or is that not? Well, you can do that with exact diagonalization. Okay, so there is one nice result using uh, matrix product operators from uh, uh, Marco Zinedaric and Antonella Scodiccio and a postdoc. So there's so there's one nice result which uh, using uh, in the not in the localized phase but in the phase that thermalizes, where where they were able to. Uh, Get something with yeah m fancier methods. I could I could talk about that a little bit at the uh, end, you know, but it's sort of a where, you know, yeah. People are trying to get matrix product state DMRG matrix product operator methods working well enough for this problem so that they can contribute to the research, right? And and there's just been this one success so far. You know, the, the, a lot of efforts. But so far, it's all just, oh, we can do just as good as exact diagonalization. But nobody, but almost never getting anything beyond exact diagonalization. Yeah, you're just talking about numerical stuff at the moment. Yeah, no, I'm talking about numerical stuff as well. Yeah, right. So, so yeah, we, we would like to get other numerical methods contributing to this problem. And, and, and that's, that's an effort that's happening. But, uh, you know, it's just getting started, and it's harder than it initially looked. <laughs> There's a bunch of subtleties here in, the, in, in doing that, uh, that, that, you know, I, I could talk about that, you know, I, you know, I, I could talk on this subject for 10 hours, but <laughs> generally speaking, but I won't. <laughs> How big are the chains that, that they can do numerically? 20s, maximum, you know, low 20s of spins. You know, a lot of the work, you know, is smaller, but you know, when you really have something you want to do and do it as big as possible, that's as big as you go typically is, is uh, for spin a halves, 22, 24 spins, that level. Um, 
you know. You can make it look longer by writing it in terms of Majoranas, and then it sounds twice as long because the Hilbert space per Majorana is the square root of two, right? But that's, that's kind of a cheat. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to Maribel localization, do people always look at Hamiltonian through randomness? No, 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 the quasi periodic. So you could look at quasi periodic, right. and that has many body localization. Hasn't been proven, but it, it almost certainly does. You know, in, one, in the non interacting problem, the localization is clear, and I think, I think for the ground state as well, I think Mastro Prieto, yeah, for the ground state, he's proven, but I'm not talking about ground states, right? So, so the non-interacting problem is definitely localized at quasi-periodic, as is the ground state, and there's no reason to believe that this is not true for the, many, for the excited states. But you know, that, that, that's a challenge. You know, I think that the, the te technical aspects of Mastro Pietro's proof, uh, you know, to think of doing that at, in, in the highly excited states, I think, is, uh, is a big step. Beyond. Yeah, it's, like, it's, yeah it's, it's way beyond what John did. Uh, as far as I can understand, although maybe there's something to do there. Know. Right. You know, there might be some trick there or something, but anyways. Um, okay, but let's, um, so. Yeah, yeah, but it's still the ground state for a given chemical potential. Hmm? It's the ground state for a given, for a given chemical potential, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's, but that still doesn't help you understand the excited state. So I know. Yeah, right. That's a different, yeah, right, right. So I view, you know, in Anderson localization, there's sort of three problems. There's the single particle problem. There's the ground state problem, the ground state interacting problem. And then there's this problem, which is yeah. interacting and not in the ground state. And they're really three different things. Um, but one has to, you know, and they have certain commonalities, but they have very important differences as well. Um, okay, so, so we're interested in uh, this limit, as far as I can tell, limit, and then this, is, this would be one way of saying what the limit we're interested in is, 1 over t, say integral, for example. So we go to long times take a time average to get rid of all the recurrences and things that, it, you know, in a finite size system, if you look at a particular time, you know, it, it, there's no proper limit because of Poincare recurrence type things. Um, but if you do a time average, this, this limit should converge for any finite size system. And then you ask, as I take, you know, you know, start from some initial state, what does it go to for the finite size system? And then take the limit of the infinite system and then ask, uh, and then the question is, does it self-thermalize? Or basically, the physical question we're asking is, is this system, this large system, able to act as a bath and bring all subsystems to thermal equilibrium? Right. So when we say the system thermalizes, we don't mean the full system goes to the Boltzmann distribution. What we mean is subsystems, it, we mean the full system acts as a bath and brings subsystems to states which are the same as what they would be at thermal equilibrium because there is a bath. Right. So sorry for the question. So limit, which limit, limit of which quantities are you computing? Uh, for example, okay, the state of a subsystem as a function of time. So let's break the system into a subsystem, which is finite, and then the rest of the system. And then when we take the limit, we're going to take this to infinity first, you know, and keep this finite. So this limit here is on the complement of the system we're looking, the subsystem we're looking at. So this would be some finite set of the degrees of freedom. Okay? And then this, this is the trace over the complement of the state of the full system. Right, so the full system is in some state, which is undergoing unitary time evolution. So that's just deterministic and you know, doesn't really go to a Boltzmann distribution or anything because you, know, you could have started from a pure state. If you start from a pure state, it's always a pure state. But then if you take the trace over all the other degrees of freedom and just look at the state of these degrees of freedom, this will be in a mixed state. 
because it gets entangled with the rest of the system. And we're asking, is this the same? So the question is basically in these limits, right? So in these limits, we ask the question, is this the same as rho s equilibrium under some condition, some, chemi some temperature, some chemical potential, whatever, any, you know, for any conserved quantity, equilibrium is specified by you know, thermodynamic parameters. And this would be the trace over uh, the complement in, say, the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution, so equilibrium, so the equilibrium state of the full system. Right, so we have this, some standard ensemble of an equilibrium state of the full system, which might be canonical or microcanonical or grand canonical, whichever. That predicts what the subsystems do. The independence of ensembles in equilibrium means that this, in these limits, is independent of which ensemble I take. Right, that's equilibrium statistical mechanics. So this is a well-defined thing in the limit. And the question is, does the dynamics get you there? And the many-body localized systems don't. Get, they stay in a state near the equilibrium state, ne, sorry, near the initial state. So if you start them in an initial state which is not in equilibrium, they will stay near that state. And the states of the subsystems will not converge to what they would be at equilibrium. They have a memory. So this local subsystem in the many-body localized phase will have a local memory which you can recover at this location to infinite time of some information about the initial state, how, so it, how it was out of equilibrium. What temperature and the chemical potential be? Uh, you know, how do I select those? Well, that's set, so the initial state has an energy. Yeah. OK, so there's another piece of fine print, which is the initial state. If there are conserved quantities, the initial state, those should not have too much uncertainty. right? So we want the initial state to have a well-defined energy density so that it has a well-defined temperature. And when it goes to equilibrium, it's at that temperature. Right, so you can make a cat state, which is at two different temperatures. And an isolated system, it'll stay at two different temperatures forever. And that, so, so there's certain initial states which won't go to equilibrium because the conserved quantities have too much uncertainty. And equilibrium, they never have that much uncertainty. Right, but those are unphysical initial states. Right, any way you would physically prepare an initial state in a large system, you wouldn't make a cat state. You would make you know, some energy density, some particle density, things like this. Right? So it's all in the initial state. Yeah, so this, these come from the initial state. Yeah. The energy density of the initial state, the particle density of the initial state, and any other conserved quantity. Yeah. That, you know, if it goes to equilibrium, it's got to be the equilibrium associated with that density. Right? OK, so I think that's the, the question. I think it's pretty precisely posed, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Although I know the standards in this room are different than mine. <laughs> what? We're trying to learn how to think about these things. <laughs> OK, so this is a question which you think, you think it might have two answers, yes and no. <laughs> But there's, in some sense, three answers, because <laughs> uh, there's fine print on yes. <laughs> so the answers to that question, there's you know, one possibility is no, right? And this is, this is, if that is true, we call this the MBL phase. And this uh, you know, stays, um, yeah, what do, what do I want to stay? Yeah, right, what I just said stays localized in some sense near initial state forever. And this remains true as we take the thermodynamic limit. Right? And this this is basically, you know, it's in Anderson as a conjecture, 1958, uh, really bringing it back to uh, the attention of everyone was this key paper, Bosco, Elena, Altschuler, 2006, where they sort of said this much more explicitly and insisted on it being true, much more so than Anderson did, because Anderson, it was just sort of, oh, here's an idea. Seems plausible. 
Um, but then he went to the single particle problem. Um, so that part of the paper generally. Uh, and then we have Imbri, uh, 2014, where he more or less proves this for this model. I should say he proves it for this model with one assumption. So he has this one assumption he has to make, which is called level, limited level repulsion, which uh, no one would ever suggest it might be false. <laughs> and he, but he spent two or three years trying to prove the assumption. And after a while, he realized, no, let's just have it be a, an assumption. Right. Right. So that no one's ever heard of, sorry, limited level attraction was, the, was his assumption he had. Right. So, so his proof is only a problem if there is some massive conspiracy which causes the exact eigenstates of the Hamiltonian to accumulate very strongly near each other. Right? And there's absolutely no evidence or any ideas of how that might ever happen. Um, so it's essentially a proof. But in 1D for short range interactions. <laughs> So, strong disorder. Yeah, and strong enough disorder. Right, yeah, with disorder. Sorry. With, with, strong, with disorder. strong randomness. Thank you. Right. Now, so, so the assumption, you know, I mentioned, you know, and that's, that's, right, that's something that's probably just technical. Initially, I thought some of these other things were technical, like 1D. <laughs> but uh, uh, they may not be. So there's good ideas around now, which I could talk about later if there's time, as to why these two assumptions are really absolutely essential and many body localization may only exist with randomness in 1D with short range interactions. Um, and in fact, even exponentially decaying interactions m might not be enough unless they decay fast enough. Right, so the bound is within the exponential decaying interactions. They have to decay faster than some l decay rate of order one, right? And so there's some very nice work on that from uh, Daruk and Huveniers, um, which is looking more and more plausible with time as we investigate it. Um, so, that, so that's an interesting point. Now, there's also the issue of the quasi-periodic. So, so it may be that with quasi-periodic, as opposed to randomness, Many body localization is more robust, and so it might survive, say, in higher dimensions if you didn't have randomness, because the instability in one dimension seems to be due to rare region effects associated with the disorder. Maybe. Okay, so, so these, are, these are some interesting questions. But, so, so these two provisos here, these may actually be essential in the presence of randomness. But this, is a, this is a very interesting set of questions that are being investigated. Excuse me? OK, so I want to have no symmetries. Right, so there's a whole bunch of things to say with symmetries. right? And, and a lot of symmetries look like they're bad for many body localization. So there's a whole bunch of results with, particularly if you have some non-abelian symmetries, it's believed you can't have many body localization. Um, so, so yeah, there's a whole bunch of interesting questions there about you know, what, what conditions destabilize many body localization. And it looks like certainly non-abelian symmetries do so. Um, you know how the, the exact bound the exact boundaries of that are are unclear. But but see, I've the things I've written down here have no symmetries, right? Because if there's if there's a field, well, okay. So this has this has a conserved sigma z, but once you fix that, it has no symmetries, right? And the conserved sigma z doesn't doesn't cause a problem. So just a simple u one symmetry doesn't doesn't have isn't a problem. Um, and this has, this has no symmetries, this one here, right? And I want to talk about the generic case. There's a whole bunch of interesting questions there, but, but let's just leave those aside. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can I yeah. So from, from what you're saying, it seems like once it doesn't thermalize, it must stay localized near the initial state. Why, why is that so? I mean. Uh, we don't know that for sure. Okay. I mean, 
it seems like it's just an example of a possible no, but there might be some other situations where it doesn't go to the equilibrium, but also doesn't stay at the same place, it just goes somewhere else. Yeah, so, so we, we, we don't have, <coughs> so there's been a lot of talk about intermediate things which are neither one nor the other and are somehow intermediate, but so far I don't know of a proposal for you know, these kinds of systems where it's spelled out what it really means, what the suggestion really means. You have these kinds of things in, say, what Simone's been working on in these uh, beta lattices, you know, single particle problems. You've got funny kind of intermediate states. So those intermediate cases, which are sort of neither fully delocalized nor, nor fully localized, do exist in sort of infinite dimensional single particle problems, right? Yeah. And so they could be here, right? But my feeling is that's special to those problems and it, it doesn't apply. But this is, that's another open question, right? Is could, could those kinds of intermediate things that do happen on you know, random graphs and beta lattices, could they actually apply for these sort of a little bit more physical problems, right? And that, that's an open question. Yeah. So I don't want to insist that what I'm going to list are all the possibilities, right? No, that's not preventing from thermalizing. You know, if, if you have too big an uncertainty in the initial energy, it doesn't go to a Boltzmann distribution, but it just goes to a linear combination of Boltzmann distribution. So it is thermalizing. It's just you happen to give it a state which has an uncertain temperature. So, so I wouldn't view those as, those are, those are cases where it could, you know, it thermalizes as best as it could given the initial state. And only because of thermodynamics. Right, and so, so, so I, don't, I don't view that as not thermalizing. I just view that as a silly initial state. See what I mean? Okay, so there's this, right? There's yes. Um, and the dis this distinction between this and this is a sharp distinction. So, so this would be a phase transition. Right. If we had a system which for one set of values of the parameters is localized and another value thermalizes, there has to be at least one phase transition between those two because we're talking about sharp distinctions. Right? And so that's one of the in points of interest. So there's a phase transition. Um, and this, if the answer is yes, I call it the thermal phase. Now here, you know, just like in the single particle problem, Proving delocalization is harder than proving localization. So the thermal phase, I don't think there's any, any uh, for, for these kinds of models, there's no rigorous results at all. But the numerics is very good. So, so for this, we have very, very good numerics on, on these kinds of spin chains. You know, if you make them large and you go far enough into the thermal phase so that you're you know, well into this phase, you know, they're really very strongly quantum chaotic and things converge very quickly to uh, to uh, agreeing with equilibrium, you, know, you could say, oh, it's only 20 spins, but 2 to the 20 is a million, right? So it's a, it's a big Hilbert space. Yeah, and, and that's what allows the numerics to actually be really quite compelling. Um, it's because the Hilbert space is, the Hilbert space gets big. Is there a notion of rates of equilibration that you... Well, that's, okay, so that's the small print. Okay, okay. so what was I going to say about this? So system does thermalize. Right, and it'll have you know, GOE or GUE or whatever uh, level statistics. So it'll look like, you know, such systems. If you look actually, you know, on on the scale of the eigenstate level spacing, they look like random matrix type stuff. Right, so quantum chaos is another word for this. Right, whereas the the many body localized is not chaotic. It's a type of integrability, as I'll tell you in a minute. Um, okay, but in here, there's, there's sort of, there's definitely a distinction, um, or an important distinct, an important two different regimes, which are not sharp. Defined. So, you know, this, and, and you were just asking about time scales, and so, you know, we don't have any strong results about it, but it's definitely the case that there are regimes where it happens uh, you know, on accessible time scales, 
right? For the numerics or for the experiments, you know, people do experiments. You know, the question is, can they see it equilibrate, you know, on the time scales before, right? Of course, the experiment it's never fully isolated from the environment, and so there's a limit to the time scale you can do. And on that time scale, does it thermalize already, or or, or can't we tell, right? And this regime certainly exists, right? Because we see that in the numerics. Um, but then you also have, uh, you know, it takes almost forever, <laughs> but not quite, right? That somehow there's a slow, very slow relaxation, perhaps some non-perturbative effect. That means the MVL phase isn't really stable, but it's almost stable. And there's certainly such regimes here as well in the numerics. Right? And then, of course, the distinction here, not being sharp, this is just some crossover, sort of like the distinction between a liquid and a glass in the structural glass problem. And so one of the challenges in the subject is to tell the difference between this and this, <laughs> and to tell the difference between this phase transition and this crossover. And you know, so one of the hopes is maybe if we can understand this phase transition enough and understand this crossover enough, we can tell the difference between them and we might be able to tell the difference between this and this because of that you know, as you approach it. I don't know. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it plays out, um, if ever. <laughs> right. And so this, this regime here, you know, or, or, you know this, can, this can come from um, various uh, non-perturbative uh, instabilities of MBL. You know, like for example, in Bosco, Elaine, or Altshuler, they just did perturbation theory. They would have MBL stable in all dimensions. But then if we believe what I was saying from Daruk and Huvenier is it's only stable in one dimension. If you're in higher dimensions, you get something that's almost localized, but it's destabilized by some non-perturbative effect. And that's going to take some exponentially large time. And, 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 right. and then you can even have something which is very close to many body localized with a translationally invariant Hamiltonian. So there's some models, you know, if you have different terms in the Hamiltonian, which are on different energy scales and set up just right, even though the system is translationally invariant, it can be very close to localized. And this has been shown numerically. But again, uh, you know, there are non-perturbative effects. We think that would mean it's not truly localized, right? And so, so, so you can definitely get into this regime much more broadly. You know, it's much more forgiving. Right? And Simon was mentioning, you know, you could have some symmetries which makes MBL in principle forbidden, but you might also have strong disorder so that although it's forbidden, the instability takes a very long time. So, so this regime, you can probably get into this regime for almost any kind of model if you take the parameters to s sort of extreme values. Right? Whereas this regime here, you know, we're talking about really existing in the limit, it seems to be much more restrictive. OK. This, this last thing that you said seems a little surprising. Now, if you have more symmetries, you'll have more conserved quantities. So why would you be more chaotic? Well, translational invariance is the extra, con on a, you know, say, on a lattice. Translational invariance, the extra conserved quantity you get is just a crystal momentum. You know, it's a quasi-momentum. It's not an extensive quantity. It doesn't get transported. So it's just sort of, you know, it's just like one extra thing. Um, but the, you know, the extra symmetries, they sort of mean every state you might get localized in, there's a bunch of equivalent other states which are degenerate with it under the symmetry, right? You know, sort of if you assume I'm localized in a particular state which breaks the symmetry, then all the other states related by the symmetry are degenerate with it. Right? And then if they're degenerate, how come they don't mix? Right? That's, that's sort of the general framework of it on a casual level of why the symmetry would, uh, there would are, cause there, it. There are theorems that say you can't, you can't localize in some sense? We've got to no, I don't think any of them are theorems, no. Arguments. Yeah. Theoretical physics arguments. Yeah, but convincing. 
<laughs> they're not super solid. Compelling, maybe, is what I would say. Compelling. <laughs> like, I'm inclined to believe them, but <laughs> if somebody came up with the other argument and it was just as compelling, then I'd, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be interested, right? You know, it's not like something where, yeah. You know, these are, these are hard problems. These are very hard problems. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna go to this model here and just say a little bit about the MBL phase. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So, somehow. So I understand. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So I understand the perturbation theory for the because it's very much like what John does, except maybe in a little bit simplified form. But uh, but for the for the localized side. Right. But now, if I want to do the extended side, does it look a little bit like a beta lattice type of calculation? Because it's you know, when I heard the line well, they, problem, do the, they do do that, yes. They that's do that's that. one type of calculation they do, is, yeah. is a beta lattice type calculation. Yeah. Lattice yeah. Now, I don't know whether, I don't know, do you know this, Simone, whether, whether their results for the delocalized phase are really seriously based on the beta lattice calculation? In, in, in say, Bosco, Elena, Altschuler? I think it's more, phenom yeah. it's more phenomenological, I think. I think there's a lot more, I think, you know, as you would expect, the way they treat the delocalized phase is much more phenomenological or hand-waving or assumption-based rather than the localized phase, where they're really doing a systematic perturbation theory. Right? You know, and, and, and if they're wrong, it's only because of non-perturbative effects, which they shouldn't have been able to see anyways because they were just doing perturbation there theory. There was also some work by Mirlin around that same time, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, which overlaps. Yeah. Yeah. No, those, those two pieces of work, as far as I know, they basically agree on everything except who should get the credit for it. Yes. <laughs> There's no sub substantive physics disagreement there. Um. <laughs> okay, so the MBL phase in 1D that Imbri's proof is about um, is a type of uh, integrable system. And, you know, just to talk about that informally, we can take this model here with these fields, and I think we can do this either random or quasi periodic, either one's fine. We can turn J off. Right? This is turned off. Now that's a very simple problem, and it's localized, right? Because you know, we have, so at j equals zero, we have all of these integrals of motion, you know, sigma z n, sigma z m. So this is a con, this, they all commute with each other, and they commute with the Hamiltonian. Yeah, it's trivial. It's trivial, right? And, and it's localized, right? Because right, any energy I put on a given site or any z component of the spin that I get it put on a given site, those are the two conserved quantities, it stays where you put it right? because there's no, there's no hopping. It's a trivial statement. Um, but I think it's, you know, you might, you might ask, you know, when we have a many-body system like this, where there's a spin at every site, what do we mean by being localized? Right? The wave function's everywhere. It's not like the single particle problem. In the single particle problem, if you have a particle hopping around, you really mean the wave function is localized in the localized phase, whereas here the wave function necessarily is everywhere, because in the wave function, every spin has a state. Right? And so the wave function isn't localized in real space in many body localization. But what's localized are operators that commute with the Hamiltonian at least in the, in the many-body localized phase that we understand. Now, it might be there are some other 
things which are localized, right? You know, there could be something intermediate between this and this where there's some other structure, but uh, you know, the case we do understand, what's localized isn't the wave function, but a bunch of operators. So, so this is the equation for an operator that commutes with a Hamiltonian, and if I can find operators which are spatially localized, meaning they decay exponentially away from some point, or decay fast enough, doesn't even have to be exponential, but it should be fast enough, then we can say it's many-body localized if you have uh, s you know, such operators. Right. So what's localized isn't the wave function, but the conserved quantities. Right. Now in this problem here, we have a complete set of conserved quantities, right? because every eigenstate of this Hamiltonian is just plus one or minus one for each one of these operators, and that's the whole space. Right. So, so certainly one intermediate thing you could imagine is you have some localized operators, but you don't have a complete set. But you know, we know of no example that has that structure. Okay, so then you just add uh, small j perturbatively and properly, you know, and this is what John Embry does. So you add the small j perturbatively, including bounding all non perturbative effects, right? And that's the step you can only do in 1D with short range interactions. And, and you basically get some dressed uh, conserved pseudo spins, and we call them tau. So, and their z component is the conserved thing. So tau z n would be sigma z n plus dressing. And then you have the same. And there's a local dressing. Yeah, local dress. Yeah, local dressing. Very, very important to the local, right? right. Not strictly local. No, no, just local. you know, decaying rapidly enough so that you can call it localized. Um, and it might be. Um, the decays aren't exponential. There are ideas for why the decays might not be exponential. They might be stretched exponential with longer tails than exponentials. This isn't clear. You know, John's, John's proof doesn't prove exponential. It only proves inside of, I forget whether he bounds it with a certain stretched exponential or he just says it's faster than any power law. I forget, I forget exactly what he proved. But there's, there is room there and there are ideas around for why it might be slower than exponential to be a stretched exponential. Is it still the same result as requires the level of instruction? Yeah, 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 no, there's, he just has one result. <laughs> um, so, so you just, it's the same equations, so we have a complete set of such operators, and this, basically, John proves this, or something equivalent to this. He doesn't put it in these terms, but... So you get a complete set of localized conserved operators which commute with the Hamiltonian with each other. And, and you can set it up, we believe, so that, so that uh, the tau z and tau, so they have the Pauli algebra and tau z and tau y are also localized. Um, that's been so explicitly looked at. Okay. And this is true. For small enough you know, j over h, right? You know, when the when the interactions are small compared to the potentials, um, but he proved it only for the random case. Right? He didn't, not for the quasi-periodic case. Um, and nobody's looked at it really critically. So the quasi-periodic case hasn't been looked at that much. You know, we do, for the random cases, explicitly construct these operators and look at them. Nobody's done that yet for the quasi-periodic case to see if there's something different going on in the quasi-periodic case. So, so suppose that we prove the unit level of traction for quasi-periodic case. Would it, would it apply this or not really? I doubt it. 
Oh, so no, so I think the technical something. difference, you know, the limited level of, you know, the, there's other technical differences because he's using the randomness very heavily in, in that proof as far as I understand. So that, you know, whereas the quasi-periodic has got all these very special properties and number theoretic properties. And so it's, it's, it's technically very different, at least as far as I understand. Not that I know it very well. Correct me if I say something wrong <laughs> about that. Um, okay. And so each instance of the Hamiltonian has its own specific set of conserved quantities, right? So these are, these are conserved, you know, it's not like in a, usual integrable systems where they have a very nice structure, you evolve the Hamiltonian with a parameter and the conserved quantities evolve in some nice smooth way or maybe don't even change. Here, you change the Hamiltonian a little bit, these guys will change in very discontinuous ways and very irregular. So, so, so each, you know, each H has its own taus, but when we write the Hamiltonian in terms of the taus, right, so the Hamiltonian in terms of the original spins is, you know, typically we, we have the strictly short range in terms of the original spins, say just nearest neighbors, but then when you write it in terms of the taus, what it's going to look like this, so sum over n, some renormalized field, you know, which is renormalized from the bare field, tau zn, right, and then plus some nm, some interactions, which are only between the z components. And these will fall off, these will f either, well, typical ones will fall off exponential, or fall off fast enough with distance, and the probability of them being large will fall off rapidly with distance, right? So, so you do have cases where there's some resonance and you get a very long range interaction, but this happens with very low probability that falls off strongly with the distance. Um, and then you would have three, three spin interactions, K, N, M, L, et cetera. So you would have interactions to all orders, but only between the Z components, right? Because if the Hamiltonian commutes with all the Z components, it can't contain any X's or any Y's. Right, so the Hamiltonian only contains identities and Z's, and it doesn't contain any all, X's or Y's. All of how Z's commute. They commute with each other, yeah. yeah. And they commute with this Hamiltonian because there's nothing in it but tau Z's. Yeah. Right. And that's the, so this is what we call, okay, so these guys we call, these guys we call the L bits, localized bits, you know, sort of like qubits, but they're different than, you know. And so this we call the L-bit Hamiltonian, where we take the Hamiltonian and write it in terms of the L-bits. And, and you know, you can numerically, okay, there's not a unique specification of the taus, right? Because if I take the product of two taus, that's also a Pauli operator and has the right algebra and everything. So there's, a, there's some freedom in defining the taus. So what you would like to do is you'd like to find the, operators that do this and are most localized. And we don't know how to solve that problem systematically, but we can get numerically sets of such operators which are well localized. It hasn't been optimized because we don't really know how to systematically optimize it numerically. Um, you know, and then you can do that and then you can look at the Hamiltonian, you can look at the statistics of these coefficients that get generated and things, things are well behaved. Um, Well, no, just their limit. They're unique in that limit, yes. What, but, well, but that's not, I mean, if you, right. if you were to take a product of two such things, then at j equals zero, they wouldn't be. Yeah. They, they wouldn't be right. Yeah. So no, the, no, the, the ambiguities in how to define the taus, you know, when the interaction is very weak, there's, you know, it's, it's not much. It's, so, it's not a problem. It's as you go further away, as you turn up the interactions. So, so this model, as I turn up the interactions for a fixed H, will have a phase transition at some point, right? And we want to approach that phase transition and understand what happens as we approach that phase transition, how things break down. And as you approach it, 
it becomes very hard to define the tau's and the what well, no, I should say the number of possibilities of defining the tau's that look equally good proliferates <laughs> right oh, so that there's some arbit there's definitely arbitrariness in how how John yeah sets up yeah 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 there's oh, definitely arbitrariness yeah no no he 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 had that very explicitly in his proof but but you know that could just be technical right okay. you know, he, Well, if you don't insist that they're localized, I can tell you exactly how much freedom you have. Okay. Because this is a one-to-one -one mapping, right? So all the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian are tau equals plus one or minus one, right? Oh, so so one every one bit string in terms of the taus is a Hamiltonian. I mean, sorry, is an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, okay. right? And so I can just take every eigenstate of the actual Hamiltonian and assign a random bit string to it, and that defines a set of such tau's, I see. right? So the number of possibilities is <laughs> two to the n parentheses factorial, right? That's the number of ways of defining the tau's. But almost every single one of these, they will not be localized at all. That all the tau's will be delocalized over the whole but system. It's still a discrete number of uh, possibilities. Yeah, like this this many. This many. Oh, okay. But it's a big number. <laughs> That's a big number. That's a big number. Yeah. Now, in the thermal phase, all of them, the tau's are delocalized. Whereas in the localized phase, amongst this set, there will be a very small number where the tau's are all localized, right? But we want to find the ones where they're maximally localized because you know that's that's what you want. You know, if you're talking about a localized phase and you want to have localized operators, you shouldn't settle for something that's whose localization length is ten times bigger than it could be, right? You want the smallest ones, right? Right? Because you, you know you can make them delocalized just by making a bad choice. That's not the physics, right? And so we want a way of defining them which doesn't make them delocalized just because you did a bad job of finding them. Right? You want them to delocalize because they were forced to be delocalized because there's no better way of defining them. Right? And, and so that's, it's a challenge. Um, okay. So that's MBL as integrability. Okay, and we have a phase transition. So let's take this model here. I'll draw its phase diagram down here. We often look at it this way. So H over J, so this is the randomness. Um, and there's the thermal phase here. And there's the MBL phase here. And there's a phase transition, or maybe more than one phase transition if there's an intermediate thing. They're definitely, so, so well, my, my thing got erased, so the regime where it thermalizes nicely is over here, whereas near the transition here, it doesn't thermalize nicely. So the two parts of the thermal phase are definitely there. Of course, therefore, we don't really know very well where the transition is because the distinction between the part of the thermal phase, which thermalizes extremely slowly, and the MBL phase is not clear. Right? And so we so sort of just have a bound on the transition from one side. Right, that we can see, oh, it definitely thermalizes over here, so the transmission must be on this side. Right? And that's really the situation. And then we have a proof from this side, but not really a bound. And we have nothing clear in the numerics which we would call a bound from this side. So we really don't know very well where this transition is. People are arguing about it. I think a lot of people have given much too small error bars on their estimates. <laughs> um, so, 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 so there's a phase diagram like this. Okay. So what do we know about the phase transition? OK. So in 1D, with short range interactions, it's not a proof. But I think we can say with good confidence uh, the existence of the phases, they're distinct. There must be at least one phase transition. Right? I think you know, that's not a proof. But I think that's, that's a statement which I think you know, is we shouldn't doubt that there's at least one phase transition because you know, the two limits seem very well characterized. One of them 
almost rigorously, and the other one extremely good numerics. Okay, so that's one thing. We have bounds on finite size scaling exponents. So there is this famous paper, Chase squared Fisher Spencer, which tells you the correlation length exponent gotten from finite sizes. Finite size scaling is greater than or equal to 2 over d, the spatial dimension. And this applies to MBL, as shown by Chandran uh, Laumann Oganesian. So that's on the archive, probably in 2015. So, so is, you know. This, this inequality. So is, D, is D one here? Or? D is one. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about the space dimension because it's, you know, you know, right? This is, it's the number of dimensions in which the disorder is random, right? You know, we're talking about static disorder, right? So it's, so it's the space dimension, not the time dimension. Just like in, yeah, yeah. yeah you remember. Right. Although it is a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> it's, it's a very simple argument, actually. Yeah, it's a simple argument. And, and they went through it very carefully and showing that it, you know, you might have wondered, oh, does it apply here? Because the way you did it, you know, you were making various assumptions. You weren't sure. thinking of these kinds of problems. But, but they went through it quite carefully. And I think it's, I think it's a good job of showing, uh, yes, it, it does apply to this problem. Um, so that's one thing. So, that, so, so, and then we have numerics, which is either limited by finite size or limited by finite time or both. And let me just present it finite size, OK? Uh, how, how are you defining nu here in this question, in this problem? I mean, how are they defined? Well, it's really how the transition rounds out as a function of finite size. So it's, so it's, it's basically uh, sort of informally yeah. smearing of transition goes as L to the minus 1 over nu okay. finite size. So you take a finite size system, you ask how much is this transition rounded out? Yeah. And if it's a power line L, the exponent has to satisfy that inequality. More generally, whatever it rounds out, you know, it doesn't have to be a power law, but it has to be such that, such that, uh, such that that's satisfied, right? You know, of course, it could be slower than a power law. It could be slower than a power law, and that would satisfy it, right? But it can't, the rounding out can't go away too fast with L. And it's basically just central limit theorem, right? Because you have L degrees of freedom, right? And this is one half in one dimension. So it's just basically just a central limit theorem. Um, OK, so what's the numerical situation? OK, so we've got, I want to draw a finite size diagram. So we're going to put 1 over L on this axis, the size of the system. And so this might go from 6 to 22, or from 1 6 to 1 over 22. So not a big range, but some range. And then here we're going to put this other axis. Right? And here's the putative transition. And here it's MBL, and here it's thermal. Okay, and this is the thermodynamic limit, right? So this is L equals infinity. The phase transition only exists on this axis, right? And we think of this sort of like the way people talk about quantum critical points, where you have a transition at zero temperature, and then what happens is you come up in temperature and you get something fanning out. Right, but you know you can do it finite size diagram. Have that, um, you know, in some systems in higher dimension, you could actually have a phase transition if you're only making one dimension small and keeping the others infinite. But here we're making, you know, the phase transition has to round out. Um, and so what's found is a crossover. Of course, transition rounds out, sharpens up as we go down. So it sort of looks like this, right? So there's the thermal phase. So there's a thermal regime over here. MBL over here. Above the critical point, 
it looks MBL in basically all respects uh, we've looked at. Um, and so, and this is sharpening up faster than these allow. <laughs> okay, so you, I, I drew it sharpening up pretty quickly. And th that's actually sharpening up definitely fast. So if you, if you scale these data, say from 1 6 to 1 22nd, in a bunch of different models have been looked at, and you estimate the finite size scaling exponent by that, you get about 1. But it's supposed to be greater than or equal to 2. So it's not like violating the inequality by a little bit. It's violating the inequality massively, right? So, so, so that's, right? And so, so what we now believe is it hasn't yet reached the asymptotic regime, and we've seen some signs of that already. Um, and so I believe this is going to go like this somehow, right? So when you extrapolate this, you underestimate the transition. The MBL phase is less stable than this suggests. Um, of course, the dotted, when I'm drawing the dotted lines are things that haven't been seen yet. Right? There's another challenge which you know, people are wrestling with, but so far hasn't uh, been successful, is to find some indication on this side of the transition where it crosses over. So this would be what we would call the quantum critical regime, right? if it exists. Right? Normally, you would expect in a quantum system like this, there's a quantum critical regime, and then there's the phase over here and the phase over here. Right? That's the structure you usually have. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by quantum critical, but I mean that if you the 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 properties of the system here look like the critical point. They don't look like this phase. Right? Uh, so uh, so uh, typically on a certain scale. Yeah, right. Well, but that scale you don't have right, you're up here at some you can't look at long scales because they don't exist because we're in a finite size system, right? So, so, so a typical critical point, this would be power law, this would be gapped and exponential. Right, right. And you look in here and it looks like power laws, but you can't probe it to large length scales because you, only have, a so you, you only have a finite size system. But the sc length scales you can look at, it looks, you can't tell. So the idea of the quantum critical regime is the behavior is like the critical point and you can't tell, given the limited size you have, side which side you're on, you. right? But when you look at these guys, it looks like you're on this side, right? Even if you're over here when you're very confident you're actually on this side, right? And the, a contrast between this and this has not yet been found. I would guess it exists, but nobody has yet found. I, I would guess it exists, but it's subtle. It's somehow rather subtle. That and we haven't. Right, that dotted line on the right might be more. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. It could be. Yeah, right. So, so, so this is a question. It could be, yeah. So this is a question. Does it exist? You know, is it more here? Yeah. You know, yeah. but is it is it well away from this? Is there a quantum critical regime at all? Yeah. Right. And and you know, I don't know. So 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 that's uh, that's uh, something where where uh, you know one one of the one of the things we're always thinking about in the numerics is you know, to try to find something that might actually show this line. Because if you could see such a thing like this and it was drifting this way, then you'd have a numerical suggestion for a lower, for a, for a bound on the transition from this side. You know, we don't really have any numerical indication of something we would call a bound on the transition from this side that is really solid or credible numerically. So, so, and that's, you know, that's really something that's missing from the numerics. Okay, there's interesting Griffiths effects on both sides, so let me just write that here, G, G. If you're near the transition with disorder, you have rare region effects, Griffiths effects, a lot of interesting things there to talk about. How long should I? Which would be absent in the quasi-periodic. Which would be absent in the quasi-periodic, exactly, yes. Um, I see I've gone to 306. When should we stop? Well, maybe should we five for ten minutes? Or okay. okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, okay, so one result we have, okay, so we just posted a paper with uh, Vedika Kamani, who is a student who just graduated, and Donna, well, uh, Lim, Donna Sheng, and myself. 
uh, numerics. And we were looking at this crossover up here. Now, if this, you know, and this violates these inequalities. Um, now, what, what, when, when you do this, you, 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 okay, yeah, okay, so first, what, what's a typical thing we look at? So a typical thing we look at, you know, one of the, one of the things that's looked at a lot, which is, which it seems nice, and, you know, gives us the feeling we're really getting at the physics, although maybe we're <laughs> deceiving ourselves, is you take the Hamiltonian, so we take a Hamiltonian like this one, we diagonalize it, get all the eigenstates, look in the middle of the spectrum, so we're not talking about low temperatures, and, and, and look at all those eigenstates on a system of length L, and then we cut it in the middle and measure the amount of entanglement between the left half and the right half of the system, and quantify the entanglement, right? And in the thermal phase, that entanglement is thermal equilibrium entanglement proportional to the volume of the subsystem, whereas in the localized phase, that entanglement is just, just of order one or less. It's just entanglement right at the cut, no long range entanglement. So it goes from boundary law to, air, to volume law entanglement. And that's what this is here, right? So it happens over here, right? And then near here, the entanglement is volume law but subthermal in the middle of the crossover, and it varies enormously from state to state within the same sample, eigenstate to eigenstate within the same sample, and it also varies from sample to sample. Right? Now these inequalities are about sample to sample differences. They're not about state to state differences within the samples. Right? And what we found, which was, a, so, so, so what we've done is we've taken the probability distributions of the entanglement of states, we not only look sample to sample differences, state to state differences within the same sample, but we also cut out different pieces within the same sample and the same state, and we call it cut to cut differences. So we, so we sort of look at three levels of variations, cut to cut, state to state, sample to sample, right? And in this regime here, the uh, sample to sample differences are growing with size faster than can be asymptotic, right? So what we find here is, is uh, you know, S, let's say delta S sample, which means, so, so S is the entanglement entropy, so we quantify the in entanglement by the von Neumann entropy of entanglement, and, and we average it over all states in a sample, and then look at the sample to sample variations. And this is going as L to a power, and the power is a bit bigger than one. And that's just impossible because yeah. it's a bounded quantity. It can't grow faster than L, right? And so we have to be in a transient regime, right? And that's exactly what you'd expect if you're not yet in the regime where it's going to be affected that's by this exponent. Just another, just another yeah. way of seeing more clearly why. So, so, there, so there's some crossover here, which is past where we can go in exact idealization, um, where it must cross over to a regime where the sample to sample differences are dominant over the within sample differences, and then it, maybe it'll cross over to something obeying this. Um, and so actually one of the challenges, that, you know, and, and, and after, after doing this I realized, you know, we we should be looking at models where we very consciously make them more random, which we never really did, right? So when you do a model like this, you know, you think, oh, I don't want my j to get near zero because that'll just decouple the system and that's, that's trivial. But maybe that's not what we should do because the scaling behavior, the fixed point, does have very weak links in it. <laughs> so we should take a distribution of the j that goes all the way down to zero. And so, so, so there's something I want to explore there, which is to very consciously try to make models which are already at very strong randomness, and then maybe at the finite sizes we can get to, they will be further down this crossover, and maybe we'll begin to see it better. Um, so, that, so, that's, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is this quasi-periodic. So what we've done, we, you can take the quasi-periodic, which has this behavior here, you know, h cosine something irrational number, right? And, and so you could just view this as a phase, which depends on n, and in the quasi-periodic it depends on n deterministically, and then we could do the exactly the same model just with a random phase up here. 
So then the fields are, have the same distribution, in one case deterministic, the other case random, but they just are cosine of a phase. One case the phase is random, one, one case it's random, one case the phase is deterministic. And then we explicitly compare those two models. And what we find is that the quasi-periodic, um, the MBL phase is a lot more stable. Of course, there shouldn't be the Griffiths effects. And I think the Griffiths effects, we think the Griffiths effects, rare regions that are trying to thermalize this MBL phase, that's what this physics is here of this coming down, that the, the, the MBL phase goes unstable because of rare regions that destabilize it. And that's what Daruk and Huveniers are suggesting as well. Um, and so when we do the quasi-periodic case, the transition is quite a bit further over, and it might, be the, it might be that the exponents we're seeing here are roughly the correct exponents for a non-random problem, and that the systems we're looking at in the random problem, they're so small, they don't yet know they're random, right? Because the, the deterministic Hamiltonians make quantum chaos over here, so, so a, a, a Hamiltonian which has no external randomness on it, in some sense makes randomness when you're over in this part of the phase diagram because quantum chaos makes essentially random states out of non-random Hamiltonians, right? And so it might be that this is the behavior of a non-random Hamiltonian that just happens to be occurring in a random Hamiltonian. But so, so that's sort of where we are. Um, and so, so I, because of that, I've become very interested in you know, expanding the repertoire of models that are seriously explored in both directions away from what we've normally looked at to go to less random and to go to more random. Just because you know, I, think, I think this will, you know, there, there is interesting landscape out there and I think it'll inform the general understanding. So that's, that's, uh, that's probably where I should stop given the time. All right. Any well, more questions? I have a few, but maybe we could hold it for tea time. Yeah, get some cookies and yeah, yeah. Yeah, All right, yeah. David, thank you. Yeah, there's, much. there's, you know, there's enormous number of things I've mentioned here which we could talk about more. Yeah, I yeah know. and just so many open it's, questions, it's, 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 and it's just a very rich subject. Yes, it is. Well, thanks very much.